Hi, it's Katrina, Ziggurat of Ur. The Great Ziggurat of Ur was discovered and excavated in the 1920s by Sir Leonard Woolley. It is the largest ziggurat that's ever been found and was built by the ancient Mesopotamians. What's a ziggurat, you ask? It's a unique building that was only ever constructed in Mesopotamia, specifically in what is today Iraq and Iran. Ziggurats are very similar to pyramids, though they are smooth and tiered. Picture the Great Pyramid of Giza had it been built straight up with multiple levels. These impressive buildings weren't used as tombs, but as places of worship. They rose high in an attempt to be closer to the realm of the gods. They were used for religious rituals and for the rulers of society as administrative offices. That'd be kind of cool. On the very top of the ziggurat of Ur was a temple dedicated to the moon goddess Nana. It was finished around the year 2100 BC by King Ur-Namu of the Third Dynasty. For miles and miles around, this would have been the tallest thing visible. It would have been something like the spire of a medieval cathedral, dominating the landscape. Unfortunately, no trace of the temple remains today. The only thing still standing is the lowest part of the ziggurat, its immense foundation of mud and brick. This is despite the fact that it was restored twice. The last Neo-Babylonian king replaced the upper terraces in the 6th century BC. Then, 2,400 years later in the 1980s, Saddam Hussein tried to restore the facade of the lower part of the ziggurat. Saddam even used the ancient structure for parking his MIG fighter jets. He believed that by parking his jets close to the ancient building, the Americans wouldn't bomb them. But he was wrong, and the ziggurat did take some damage during the American bombing campaign. Cavemen on Holiday A new discovery has shed some light on the vacation habits of cavemen 50,000 years ago. It turns out that long before the Ice Age was over, cavemen were seeking out sand and sunshine in the Mediterranean. Archaeologists have found evidence that modern human beings migrated to the south of France, probably because it was warm and tropical. But what's really interesting is that they didn't just migrate here to live. Evidence shows they came and went from the area, suggesting they only went there for a brief respite from their typical lives, then retreated back into their dark and dank caves. According to Professor Chris Stringer from the London Natural History Museum, archaeologists found projectiles carved from stone, a tooth belonging to Homo sapiens, and some other pieces of very old tools. All of these artifacts date back to about 54,000 years ago. That's 14,000 years earlier than when humans were believed to arrive in modern Europe. The conclusion here is that as the world was in the grip of a terrible ice age, Homo sapiens sought warmer lands to take shelter in. They visited the Mediterranean because it was one of the warmest places they could find. They hung out there for short periods of time and then went back to where they could more easily hunt big Ice Age animals. Seems like we've always wanted a vacation since the dawn of humanity. Ice Age Animal Bones Speaking of Ice Age animals, a treasure trove of bones was recently found in England during a construction project. During the establishment of a new town in Devon County called Sherford, being built in 2015, workers came across the bones of woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceroses, as well as species of wolves and hyenas. All these beasts are believed to have gone extinct at the end of the last ice age. After finding enough bones, the construction workers realized they needed to call in a team of archaeologists. The archaeologists then did a professional excavation. They uncovered teeth, tusks, and bones from a woolly mammoth. They discovered a broken skull and lower jawbone from a woolly rhinoceros and found a wolf skeleton almost completely intact. Then they discovered the partial remains of a horse, a reindeer, a red fox, and a hyena. They even found random bones from smaller mammals like bats and shrews. When they dated these bones, they found them to be from the Middle Devensian period of between 60,000 and 30,000 years ago. Even more exciting is that all these bones were found inside of a natural cave. The mystery is that archaeologists don't know exactly how so many different animal bones ended up in one place. They don't know if the animals ventured into the cave and died over a very long period, or if they had been brought there by ancient humans. Either way, it's a significant discovery and shows just how biologically diverse England was in prehistoric times. Liquid Mercury Under Mexican Pyramid 
Mexican archaeologist Sergio Gomez just announced a rather strange discovery in a chamber beneath the famous Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent. In case you don't know, this is the third largest pyramid at the ruined city of Teotihuacan in central Mexico. Sergio spent the last six years excavating a mysterious tunnel that had been discovered to lead beneath the pyramid. The tunnel was unsealed in 2003 after it had been locked up tight for 1,800 years. Sergio and his team discovered three chambers at the end of the 300-foot tunnel, reaching around 60 feet straight under the ground. In one of the chambers, they found a heap of amazing artifacts, from the remains of a jaguar to a box filled with rubber balls. Now, Sergio has made another discovery. He found large quantities of liquid mercury. There is so much mercury in the deep corridor beneath the pyramid that he and his team have to wear special equipment so they don't get mercury poisoning. What's mysterious is that liquid metal didn't have any purpose for the ancient Mesoamericans who lived in Teotihuacan, but it has been discovered at other sites, usually sites linked to royal tombs. It's now believed that the liquid mercury may have been brought into the tunnel to mimic an underworld river or lake. The ancient people may have been fascinated by the properties of liquid mercury because of how shiny and reflective it is. They could have thought it was magical, and so they brought it down into the bottom of the pyramid, perhaps to protect the king's tomb. Researchers are now hoping that somewhere in the darkness below the pyramid is a royal tomb, but they haven't found it yet. Amulet of the Evil Eye Archaeologists have just rediscovered an ancient magical amulet after it was lost for 40 years. The amulet was originally discovered four decades ago at the site of an ancient Jewish synagogue. It was handed over to the Israeli Antiquities Authority, but it was stashed away in a back room somewhere and forgotten until experts stumbled across it again. To be honest, it's one of the most fascinating pieces of ancient jewelry that's ever been found. What makes the amulet so special is that it was once believed to have magical powers. It dates back 1,500 years to the Byzantine period and was used to ward off the evil eye. On the amulet is inscribed the Jewish name for God in Greek letters, Yahweh. It has the figure of a rider seated on a galloping horse with their head encircled by a halo. This person is thrusting a spear at a female lying on the ground on her back. Above the scene is the inscription, the one god who conquers evil. On the other side of the amulet is a different picture. It shows an eye pierced by arrows and something that looks like a fork. The eye is also being threatened by a pair of lions, a snake, a scorpion, and a bird. There is no doubt the amulet was magical protection against the evil eye. The evil eye originated as a concept around the 6th century BC. Ancient people in what is now Israel started believing magicians could curse someone by simply glancing at them. If you were on the wrong side of a magician's stare, their evil eye could curse you without them even saying anything. To keep themselves safe, Jewish people wore these amulets as the eye would distract all the evil. Would you wear one of these amulets to ward off the evil eye? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. Frisky Ancient Humans For years, scientists have been trying to figure out how Homo sapiens as a species beat out the other ancient hominins, such as Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and the Neanderthal. They have found plenty of scientific proof that modern humans crossbred with Neanderthals across Eurasia. But in Africa, where Homo sapiens originally emerged, there has been very little in the way of genetic evidence to show how we became the dominant species. Now, a new study done by Michael Hammer at the University of Arizona has provided evidence that not only did Homo sapiens interbreed with Neanderthals, but also with a range of other hominids. In other words, Homo sapiens were breeding with every kind of humanoid creature they could find across the African continent. They did it so often that Homo sapiens ultimately became dominant above all the others. How did they reach the discovery? Hammer and his team put modern human DNA into a computer program to reverse engineer it. They were then able to backtrack and find evidence of DNA from all the most ancient human ancestors. It looks like tens of thousands of years ago, modern humans conquered the planet by breeding aggressively across similar species. Ancient Crystal Scientists have dated a piece of incredibly ancient crystal found on a sheep ranch in Western Australia. And as it turns out, the crystal happens to be the oldest confirmed piece of our planet. It's called a zircon, and it's been dated back 4.4 billion years. John Valley, professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, says it is the oldest confirmed crystal ever taken from the Earth. 
It's translucent red until hit with electrons, at which point it turns bright blue. It's also only 400 micrometers long. At its widest point, it is no bigger than the thickness of four human hairs. But by far the most interesting part of the crystal is that judging by the ratio of oxygen isotopes inside it, scientists have been able to determine the temperature on Earth just one billion years after it was born. The temperature was such that it could have supported liquid water, meaning there may have been life immediately after the planet's creation. This would be remarkable because the oldest fossil ever found is 3.5 billion years old. Our planet formed 4.5 billion years ago. If there was life 4.4 billion years ago, it would change everything scientists know about the development of complex life forms. Medieval Gold Mines In Slovakia, two mysterious gold mines have been found from the 14th century. They were discovered by researchers in the Mala Magura Hills. Two tunnels were identified along with a field of shallow exploration pits. 700 years ago, this location was the scene of a gold rush. The exploration pits were left behind by prospectors trying to find a gold vein. They must have found one because they dug two tunnels into the hills in order to extract the gold. But other than the collapsed tunnels, archaeologists haven't found much additional evidence of what was happening here. The one artifact that really caught their attention was a rare lamp. Lamps weren't exactly used in the medieval days unless absolutely necessary. The presence of a very old lamp shows definitively that people here were going underground, but nobody has any idea how much gold was extracted from the mines. The coolest part about the discovery is that gold mines like these were scattered around Europe. Archaeologists are always finding gold jewelry in tombs and graves, but it's nice to actually see where some of that gold was mined. Drum Sculpture In the grave of a Neolithic child from 5,000 years ago, archaeologists uncovered a very remarkable drum sculpture. According to the British Museum, this has been one of the most significant discoveries of ancient art in the last 100 years. The drum was originally found in 2015, 240 miles from Stonehenge. And even though it was found so far away, Way, it was built in the same era and even resembles other objects found at Stonehenge. It's further evidence that the Neolithic people of Great Britain were all quite similar. They were all building megaliths, and they made the same kinds of art and sculptures. This drum sculpture may even have been at Stonehenge at one point, considering it was probably visited by everyone in the region at least once a year for the winter solstice. But let's get back to the drum. It's called a sculpture because it wasn't used as a musical instrument. Instead, it was either an art piece or a talisman. It was found alongside the remains of three children, none above the age of 12. Two were facing each other with their hands entwined, while the third had their arms wrapped around the others. It was a very sad and bizarre burial, and extremely out of place for Neolithic Britain. Back then, around 3000 BC, people were typically cremated. Still, researchers don't know exactly what the drum was used for. It must have been important to be buried with the children, but no one has yet discovered what its exact symbolism could mean. The New Terracotta Warriors Archaeologists have just uncovered 20 additional terracotta warriors in China. This is a big story, relating to one of the most mysterious and detailed tombs anywhere on the planet. Here is a quick recap. The tomb of the first emperor, Chen Shi Huang, was discovered completely by accident in the 1970s by a couple of locals who stumbled upon a hole in the ground. That hole in the ground turned out to be a mausoleum containing over 8,000 sculpted warriors in three enormous pits. The warriors were buried with weapons like crossbows and swords, probably so the emperor would have an army in the afterlife. But what's crazy is that no historical texts actually talk about the terracotta army or why they were put in the emperor's tomb. It's all been a bunch of guesswork on the part of archaeologists. The newly discovered warriors were found in Pit 1, which is filled mostly with infantry and chariot units. There are also warrior generals here that have been identified by their elaborate headgear. The new warriors are unfortunately shattered to pieces, but they'll be put back together by local archaeologists. Even after nearly 50 years of excavations, archaeologists are still finding new statues in the tomb. It just goes to show how revered Qin Shi Huang really was as the first emperor of the new unified China in 247 BC. 
Hattusa. Hattusa can be found in the heart of Turkey's Anatolia region, the old capital of the Hittites. It dates all the way back to the Bronze Age around the year 2000 BC. If you've never heard of the Hittites, here's a quick recap. This was an ancient civilization and a powerful empire that stretched from the Aegean Sea in what is now Greece all across Anatolia and into northern Syria. They were such a legendary people that until Hattusa was discovered in 1834, archaeologists believed it was a myth. But as we now know, this was one of the largest and most important cities of the ancient world. It was surrounded by a massive wall. The city was divided into districts and fortified with over 100 towers and five main gateways. These gateways were decorated with giant statues of lions and sphinxes. Archaeologists have estimated the population of Hattusa reached a maximum of about 50,000 people, which was a lot back in those days. They built dwellings of wood and mud and brick and erected massive temples to their pagan gods. The Assyrians had even established a trading post in Hattusa and set up an Assyrian part of the city. This was not only a major hub for the Hittites, but also an international metropolis with visitors from all over the ancient world. Alas, none of these ancient civilizations lasted forever. By 1200 BC, Hattusa and the Hittites were lost in the Bronze Age collapse. The city was gradually abandoned over several decades and the empire disintegrated. The city remained empty until 800 BC, when the Phrygians moved in and made it their own. McDermott's Castle The mighty McDermott Castle in Ireland is quite a sight to behold. While it may get less attention than other sites like the Blarney Castle, for those who really want an interesting glimpse into history, as well as the opportunity to gaze upon a structure that really looks like it came out of a fairy tale, they visit McDermott's Castle. What makes the castle unique is that it's built on an island. The castle sits in the middle of a lake, about a mile from the town of Boyle. The lake, called Loch Key, holds over 30 extremely small islands. It was the Mac de Armada dynasty that supposedly built the castle in the 12th century, but the history behind it is a little obscure. What we do know is that sometime around 1184, a bolt of lightning struck the castle on the island and caused it to burst into flames. Dozens of people died in the blaze, and several people drowned trying to swim ashore. The castle was rebuilt after the incident with the lightning. It then came under siege in 1235. Cormac McDermott, the king of Moylurg, was forced to surrender to Richard Mor de Burgh. Mor de Burg had besieged the island castle with catapults mounted to rafts and small ships. After the invasion of the island, the castle fell into disrepair. The McDermott's lost all control of it in 1586, and it slowly became the ruin it is today. The Ancient City of Termesos The ancient city of Termesos was founded by a group of Pamphylian tribes known as the Solimi. It was built near the top of the Taurus mountain range in Turkey, at an astounding height of over 3,000 feet above sea level. Construction began on a natural platform and gradually spread across the mountains until some parts of the city were over 4,500 feet tall. While the view may have been spectacular, there were some downsides to living on top of a mountain. For example, the only way to reach the city was to literally climb the mountain. But there were bonuses too. The fortified city was nestled within the mountains in such a way that attack was unthinkable. It was concealed by lush pine forests and endured for hundreds of years in peace. Today, it's one of the best-preserved ancient cities anywhere in the country of Turkey. But we don't know the exact origins of the city. Legend says it was Bellerophon who founded Termesos, a monster slayer from Greek mythology who killed the evil Chimera. What we know from ancient texts is that the Solimi were the first people here. They were part of a cult dedicated to an Anatolian god who later came to be known as Zeus. Most of what we know about Termesos comes from much after its birth, when Alexander the Great pushed his way through the area in 333 BC. Alexander compared the city to an eagle's nest and ultimately failed to conquer it. This is the guy who defeated the Persians. Yet he could see how impossible it would be to march his army straight up a mountain and try to take a gigantic city hiding in the forest. But still, Termesos ended up being destroyed. Even though it escaped war and strife for centuries, avoiding ruin at the hands of Rome by allying with the empire, the city still crumbled. Over 150,000 people were displaced when an earthquake in the 5th century AD destroyed the aqueduct and cut off the water supply. 
Everybody went down the mountain, leaving the city to become a lost ruin. The Kami Ruins The Kami Ruins are all that remain of a once great capital in southern Africa. I'm talking about the Kingdom of Butua, a group of people who built one of the greatest cities ancient Africa ever saw in what is now Zimbabwe. It was the capital for about two centuries, from between 1450 and 1644. Archaeologists believe the city was built right after the abandonment of yet another ancient city in the area, Great Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. It was after Great Zimbabwe collapsed that the Kingdom of Butua first emerged. As they slowly grew in power, trading gold and cattle with civilizations as far away as Arabia and Portugal, they needed a stronghold for themselves. On a granite hilltop looking over the Kami River, they began building an enormous city that would last forever. And they succeeded. The complex had seven main areas that were occupied by the local rulers, built above the rest of the city. In the open areas and valley beneath, there were clay houses for the subjects and peasants. In total, the site covered a whopping 266 acres. That made Kami one of the biggest urban centers in Africa at the time. It was around 1683 when Kami was finally destroyed beyond repair. The neighboring Razwi people, led by Cheng Amir Dombo, were jealous of the wealth and power being amassed in Kami. So they invaded, killed everyone, and broke the city into pieces. It's shout out time! Wanted to give a big thank you to Patricia I and Azrael and Grandma. This might just be one of the cutest messages we've ever gotten. If you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. Elephant Cave Goa Gaja, also called Elephant Cave, is an interesting and important archaeological site in Bali, Indonesia, located just 10 minutes from Ubud. The first thing you might notice about Goa Gaja is that its entrance is through the mouth of what looks like a demon. The facade of the cave, the natural rock outside, was carved centuries ago to represent the Hindu earth god Boma. Although to some, this carving is meant to represent the witch Rangda from Balinese mythology. Rangda was a witch who was known for eating children. Historians can't agree on which deity is represented here. Either way, you have to enter the cave through a gaping mouth. Much of Elephant Cave remains unexplored to this very day. The last excavation took place in the 1950s, discovering relics from before the 11th century. Nobody has any clue when exactly the cave started being used by people, nor even when the carving showed up, but it was at least 1,000 years ago. Goa Gaja was first mentioned in literature in 1365 in a Javanese poem. Archaeologists believe it may have been used initially as a sanctuary for Hindu priests. These priests likely carved the cave themselves by hand, then used it as a temple. Would you dare enter the witch's mouth to explore this ancient cave? Or have you already? Let me know in the comments. The Limes Arabicus The Limes Arabicus wasn't exactly one single structure. It was more of a desert frontier, a line of defense at the edge of the Roman Empire to keep unwanted vermin out of their territory. At least that's the way the Romans would have thought of them. They built the Limes Arabicus along the border of the Roman province Arabia Petraea, separating Rome from Arabia. This was the furthest extent of Roman influence, at the edge of the desert in what is today Jordan on the Arabian peninsula. It was the Nabataean kingdom who had the unfortunate luck of being the final civilization conquered by the Romans until they hit the desert. The Nabataeans had been operating just fine out of their capital city of Petra as major traders until the Romans came along and squashed them. The Romans then built the Limes Arabicus as a way to control and survey the desert tribes beyond, making sure Rome maintained dominance in the region. Rome was so obsessed with holding on to what little part of Arabia they had that they began building new roads. These were to facilitate easier troop movement and the flow of commerce. This line of fortifications didn't do anything in the end. It was built up and built up and then troops were withdrawn in the first part of the 6th century. Rome was overrun in this part of the world by the Sasanians, and after the Muslim Arab conquest, the fortifications were all left to ruin. Nineveh Nineveh is located in modern Iraq, but it was once the greatest city in the world. It was known as Ninua, a great center of trading settled 8,000 years ago. Ancient people lived here from 6,000 BC until 3,000 BC, when it grew from a settlement to a religious center and metropolitan capital. People here worshipped the goddess Ishtar, although this changed as kings and dynasties came and went. What makes this city so special is just how many people ruled over it. 8,000 years ago, there was a small group of Neolithic people living in Nineveh. They were there for about 2,000 years until the Hatti showed up. 
the same people who built their capital at Hattusa. Once they were gone, the Akkadians took over. This was sometime around 2334 BC, when Sargon the Great conquered all of Mesopotamia and destroyed everyone in his way. An earthquake in the year 2260 BC destroyed the Temple of Ishtar, which was likely constructed by Sargon himself. The Amorites occupied Nineveh for a while, then their construction projects were demolished when the Assyrian king Shamashi Adad I chased them from the region. King Hammurabi of Babylon took the city around 1750 BC, shortly after the Assyrians regained control. This went on and on until the Battle of Nineveh in 627 AD. That was when the Byzantine Empire took over the city and brought the region under their control. But ten years later, when the Muslim conquest began, Nineveh was destroyed and never occupied again. Ciudad Perdida The only way to reach Ciudad Perdida, or the Lost City, is to hike for hours through the sweltering Colombian jungle and then climb 1,200 steps up the side of a mountain. This ancient city is almost impenetrable and remains hidden from the rest of the world in the forests of the Sierra Nevada up until the 1970s. It became one of the most important archaeological discoveries ever, like realizing there was a second Machu Picchu in plain sight that nobody had noticed. Speaking of Machu Picchu, Ciudad Perdida was built 650 years before, in 800 BC. It was home to a mysterious civilization of jungle dwellers, boasting around 8,000 inhabitants. What's truly fascinating is that it was built on a steep mountain ridge, roughly one mile above the ground below. And it wasn't like the ancient people just stacked up a bunch of rocks to build some stone hovels. They employed complex architectural knowledge. They built stone bridges linking various parts of the city, and even drainage systems to bring waste down the mountainside. No archaeologist has ever been able to confirm who lived here. The best guess is that it was the seat of power for the Tairona civilization. These people dominated the northern region of Colombia that vanished around the time the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century. A Mysterious Cave A team of explorers from the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage recently visited an ancient cave near the small village of Narangar. The cave is a natural formation in the rock that was widened thousands of years ago by hand to create a cavern about 20 feet deep and 10 feet wide. Inside the cave, the researchers came upon strange inscriptions carved upon the walls. These inscriptions were of odd geometrical formations, animals, and strange human-like figures. And here's what makes the cave so fascinating. Researchers found tools dating back to the Stone Age inside, but have no idea who actually lived in the cave or how long human activity has been going on here. The cave was known only to the villagers living nearby. They say it was occupied by a hermit until three decades ago, when a landslide made it inaccessible. However, the artwork inside the cave and the stone tools suggest people lived inside it for thousands of years, back to prehistoric times. It was never part of any major settlement or city, but was probably just a cozy home for cave people to live in. It was then probably occupied by random hermits and Hindu holy men until the landslide made it too difficult to reach. Katna Katna was first occupied in the 3rd millennium BC, but quickly became a thriving city in ancient Mesopotamia. It was positioned on an important crossroad between the Mediterranean, where places like classical Greece and Egypt were thriving, and Mesopotamia. This city reached its peak during the Bronze Age thanks to facilitating trade between people like the Egyptians and the Mitanni. It was too important to be destroyed by any of the larger powers because of its neutrality. It was a massive trading hub where all different people could meet and prosper. But with time, Katna became its own local kingdom. By 2000 BC, it was the capital of a regional power slowly spreading through the southern Levant. It continued to grow until it was sacked by the Hittites in the 14th century BC. After it was conquered for the first time, its strategic position wasn't so strategic anymore. It found itself in the middle of battle after battle, being beaten down, resettled, and passed from one ruler to another. All that finally ended when the Assyrians bombarded the city in 720 BC, reducing what was once a proud, self-governing kingdom to a tiny village of herders. Predator X in 2009, the media went wild over the discovery of a ferocious prehistoric beast with four times the bite power of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Dubbed Predator X, the large-headed aquatic hunter is from an extinct group of marine reptiles known as pliosaurs. Fossils of two specimens that were discovered in Svalbard, Norway, indicated that Predator X may have measured up to 40 feet long. It had a six and a half foot long skull, which explains why scientists believe that it had such an immensely strong bite. 
This head was larger than most people. I mean, how tall are you? But it wasn't until 2012 that scientists formally named and described the creature called Pliosaurus funke. Predator X lived throughout the world's oceans around 150 million years ago during the Jurassic era. Truthfully, it's difficult to say exactly how big the species was, because experts only have partial skeletons to work from when it comes to calculating its size. With such limited evidence to base their calculations on, researchers are also unable to estimate the animal's bite force with any certainty. One thing that is clear is P. Funke's ferociousness. In the words of study co-author Patrick Drunkenmiller, they were the top predators of the sea. They had teeth that would make a T-Rex whimper. Predator X shared the ocean with other ancient giants, including other pliosaurs, which were characterized by their short necks, pear-shaped bodies, massive heads, and four flippers. Thalato Archon Thalato Archon was a type of marine reptile known as an ichthyosaur. It lived around 245 million years ago, during the Middle Triassic period. The type species of this creature's genus was discovered in Nevada in 1997, but Thalato Archon itself wasn't described until 2013. We've been learning a lot about prehistoric creatures recently. They existed at the beginning of a lengthy era dominated by large aquatic predators. Most ichthyosaurs had simple conical teeth, but Thalato Archon had double-edged, blade-like teeth. Its largest tooth measured around 4 inches long. This species also had large eyes set into a large head, which was roughly twice as big in ratio to its body size as the heads of other ichthyosaurs. Thalato Archon's formidable size and terrifying teeth ranked it as an apex predator among other ichthyosaurs at a time when land-dwelling reptiles were migrating to the sea in large numbers. Unlike some of these creatures, it was especially well-suited to marine life after having emerged into existence just 5 million years after the world's worst-known mass extinction, known as the End Permian Event. Scientists point toward its adaptability as a sign that aquatic life rebounded impressively quickly after the event compared to their land-living cousins. The Tully Monster 300 million years ago, parts of North America were covered by a shallow inland sea. At the time, the Maison Creek area of what is now Illinois was home to numerous soft-bodied animals. One of the most bizarre prehistoric discoveries scientists have made there is the Tully Monster. At first glance, it resembles a slug, but where you would expect its mouth to be, it had a long, thin appendage with what looked like grasping claws. Its eyes were located at the end of stalks protruding from its body. The creature is downright strange, and for decades since its discovery, scientists have been trying to determine exactly what it was. They can't seem to agree on whether it was a vertebrate, meaning it had a backbone, or an invertebrate, meaning it had no spine. Researchers claim to finally solve the mystery in 2016. They argue that the Tully monster was a vertebrate because its eyes have more in common with animals that have backbones. The team concluded that the creature was a jawless fish distantly related to modern-day lampreys. On the other hand, another group of experts identified several invertebrates that also have the eye features that the other scientists used for classifying the creature, calling into question the accuracy of their findings. It seems as though the more people look into it, the more confusing it gets, leaving them with more questions than answers. Lyopleurodon The extinct Lyopleurodon marine reptile genus encompassed two species, both of which may very well qualify as some of the mightiest aquatic creatures of all time. These apex predators lived between 165 and 155 million years ago during the late Jurassic period in what is now France. At the time, sea levels were much higher than they are today, and the area was covered in a shallow body of water. The larger of the two species, Lyopleurodon ferox, typically grew between 16 and 23 feet long, with the biggest known specimen likely measuring over 33 feet long. On average, the species' weight ranged between 2,200 and 3,700 pounds. It's difficult to definitively measure the creature's size, however, because scientists have only found limited fossilized remains. With four large, flipper-like limbs, these ambush predators were strong swimmers. They were capable of accelerating quickly, which was a major advantage when it came to pursuing prey. But these prehistoric sea monsters were not infallible. Lyopleurodons and other pliosaurs ultimately lost their battle for survival against a newer, more adept, and deadlier group of reptiles known as mosasaurs. Coelacanth Nicknamed living fossils, coelacanths are primitive-looking deep-sea fish that, until relatively recently, scientists thought were extinct. 
Everyone assumed they disappeared along with the dinosaurs around 65 million years ago, but they learned otherwise in 1938 when a live specimen was found off the African coast. There are two known coelacanth species. Experts think that these ancient deep dwellers, which have been around for an estimated 400 million years, represent an early evolutionary stage of fish transitioning into land animals, according to National Geographic. Found at up to 2,300 feet below the waves, coelacanths are both slow-growing and slow-moving. They reach more than 6.5 feet long and weigh as much as 200 pounds. Scientists originally believed that coelacanths live somewhere between 20 and 60 years, but a recent study by French researchers found that they have a lifespan of up to 100 years. Females become mature during their late 50s, and pregnancies are thought to last for around 5 years. Males reach sexual maturity between 40 and 69 years old. The coelacanth's lengthy reproductive cycle unfortunately does not bode well for its future. These fish are extremely endangered. In fact, they're lucky they've held on for this long. After all, there's a reason experts believe that they were long extinct, and it's because they are so seldom seen. Their slow gestation cycle does little to revive the rapidly disappearing population. Sadly, this living fossil may not live for very much longer unless urgent conservation measures are taken. Why do you think these prehistoric fish live so long and take such a long time to reproduce? Let me know in the comments below! Just want to give a big shout out to Janelle Allison and Cora Blue. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel! Love you guys, and if you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family! Chronosaurus the Chronosaurus genus encompassed some of the prehistoric world's largest pliosaurs, with most measuring 30 to 36 feet long and weighing between 7 and 10 tons. Members of this genus inhabited early Cretaceous waters between 120 and 100 million years ago. There were two known Chronosaurus species. One was found in what are now New South Wales and Queensland, Australia. The other was discovered in modern-day Colombia. Scientists think that Chronosaurus may have had a worldwide presence, and that its fossils simply haven't been discovered on other continents yet. Chronosaurus was one of the deadliest marine reptiles that ever existed. It was closely related to the Lyopleurodon. The two bore striking similarities despite living some 40 million years apart. Like its earlier relative, Chronosaurus had deceptively sharp-looking teeth. In reality, the animal's ferocity came from its powerful bite, which enabled it to shake and crush its prey to death in its mouth. Its fast-swimming speed was also an advantage. Chronosaurus fed on fellow marine reptiles, as evidenced by its bite marks which were found in the fossils of other aquatic creatures of the time. Pliosaurs were eventually weakened by the evolution of creatures that were better suited to survive in a marine habitat, including sharks and a family of reptiles known as mosasaurs. By the time the dinosaurs were wiped out in the mass extinction event, pliosaurs were already virtually gone from the planet. David Attenborough Horseshoe Crab There are only four known modern horseshoe crab species, but if you rewind a few hundred million years, you'd find a vast array of horseshoe crabs that came in all different shapes and sizes. A study from last year describes one such species. Dubbed Attenborough Limulus superspinosus, it's named after the popular nature documentary host and conservationist Sir David Attenborough. It was one of many distinctly bizarre horseshoe crabs that lived between 250 and 200 million years ago, known as Australimulids. A. superspinosus lived in marginal environments along the border between land and sea, as well as in freshwater habitats, unlike today's horseshoe crabs, which live almost exclusively in marine settings. Discovered in 2018 and 2019 during research trips to Russia's Ural Mountains, this bottom-dwelling species probably ate whatever it could. Scientists are unsure why Australimulids went extinct, but they suspect that it had something to do with their proximity to freshwater environments, where they were less equipped to survive than the creatures they shared their habitats with. Two of the remaining horseshoe crab species are considered endangered. Like their ancestors, they too could soon be wiped off the planet. Unlike their ancestors, they are likely to go extinct due largely to the effects of human activity. The recently described fossil represents just one of a dozen species that are named after Sir David Attenborough, including a marsupial lion, a dragonfly, and a flower, just to name a few. Mosasaurus Mosasaurus is the type genus of an extinct group of aquatic reptiles called mosasaurs. 
They lived alongside the dinosaurs between 82 million and 66 million years ago, ruling the waters of what are now Europe and North America during the late Cretaceous. Their fossils often appear inland, where shallow seas existed during warm periods marked by higher sea levels than we see today. For example, a body of water known as the Interior Great Sea once covered a large portion of the modern-day American Midwest. These unforgiving marine monsters drove at least one reptile group, the ichthyosaurus, to extinction. Mosasaurs outcompeted these aquatic predators for food and may have also had a role in eradicating other creatures. The largest mosasaur was the 60-foot-long, 15-ton mosasaurus. It had a ferocious set of teeth that were ideal for shredding prey like fish, birds, and other marine reptiles. A second inner set of teeth acted as a safeguard to stop prey from escaping in the moments before they were devoured. Resembling a crocodile with fins, Mosasaurus was a top predator of its day. But like all the prehistoric monsters that came before them, Mosasaurus were not immune to competition from more evolved creatures. If they hadn't been wiped out during the extinction event that killed all the dinosaurs, they may have even been eradicated by vicious ancient sharks, who were faster and smarter. Basilosaurus the Tethys Sea was a tropical body of salt water that existed from around 252 million years ago until roughly 66 million years ago. It was situated between the ancient supercontinents Gondwana and Laurasia. The early whale genus Basilosaurus lived here and throughout other water bodies of the prehistoric world. These primitive marine mammals were top predators of their environments. There are two known Basilosaurus species. Fossils of one were discovered along the Gulf Coast and in the eastern United States. Evidence of the other species was found in North Africa, including Jordan, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, and possibly in Antarctica. Measuring up to 60 feet long, Basilosaurus may have been the biggest creature of its time period. It had a three-foot-long skull with a bite force comparable to a T-Rex. A study of the ancient whale's stomach contents revealed that it was, indeed, a formidable force in its habitat, feasting on fish and sharks measuring up to 20 feet long. Bite marks on these skull fossils of smaller whales bear evidence that Basilosaurus also preyed on other cetaceans. Basilosaurus likely went extinct around 34 million years ago during the Eocene-Oligocene extinction event. It was small compared to some of history's other extinction events, but it wiped out many marine creatures, including the group of reptiles that includes the Basilosaurus. Terrifying Triassic Predator Scientists believe that the largest creatures to ever exist were marine species. A recent study found that one of the biggest among these animals was an ocean-dwelling monster of the Triassic period. Formerly named Symbospondylus youngorum, it lived around 244 million years ago. It looked similar to a modern whale, but with a six-and-a-half-foot skull, it rivaled many of today's biggest cetaceans. The creature came into existence just 8 million years after the first ichthyosaurs. But based on its size, researchers think that its evolution was somehow expedited. In other words, it evolved incredibly fast for some reason. A recent study examined a fossil discovered in Nevada, where a shallow inland sea once existed. C. youngorum was the largest known tetrapod, or four-legged creature, of the Triassic. It was also the first in a long line of sea-ruling giants that seceded it. The species grew quickly thanks to its diet of ammonoids, which were small yet abundant. These findings are a small step toward completing the very confusing picture of marine mammal evolution. It's thought that C. youngorum came long before the first whales, but that it was possibly an early ancestor. The creature's fossil may open a new door into our understanding of the connections between ichthyosaurs and whales. This is just one of several ancient creatures that have been discovered and described in recent years that are giving a more complete picture of the prehistoric world. Thanks for watching! What's your favorite prehistoric creature? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already for more videos like these. See you soon! Bye!